How's it going everybody? Mike back at you with another edition of 5 Minute Gaming. And for today's show, about two to three weeks ago, I aired a show on Stern Pinball's Wheel of Fortune. And I had recorded this roughly six weeks ago before I started doing these once a week shows with my good friend, David Thiel. And after I released the show of me playing the Wheel of Fortune game and just talking about it, I definitely gave my opinions, some good, some bad. And at one point I said, I'm sure if the people that were here that made the game could say something, they would, but it's just me. Well, things have now changed for the better, and I have someone who was there. (laughs) And so, David Thiel, thank you for being with me again on the show, and I'm really excited to talk about Wheel of Fortune with you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. This was a uh, an, an interesting game, kind of. It's uh, definitely an important part of uh, Stern history and things that were going on in that time. Yeah, let's go back in that time a little bit. I I had the date and it escaped me. I think it was around 2008, nine. I know exactly. I, I checked out my invoices. So every one of these projects for me was a separate contract. And basically I sent out invoices when, uh, when I started and when the game was 25 and 50 and 75 percent done and then a final invoice for when the game was was completed so i know exactly i started on this project in june of 2007 okay and my final invoice was around december of 2007 so it was uh, this was a 2007 project i mean obviously dennis must have started it at the very beginning or maybe even 2006 he started working on it the tail end of that and i'm sure they had a, a white wood by the time i get involved um <clears throat> the game is already you know well underway well and back in 2007 i'm glad you mentioned that year that was the year i started collecting pinball machines and i want to set the record straight because we did a show on pirates of the caribbean and this is a slight addendum to that but the very first pinball machine i ever purchased was a pirates of the caribbean but here's the trick it uh-huh. wasn't the stern version it was the Papadoop Zizzle version. And so right there, that brings up all kinds of debate. Was that a real pinball machine? Well, at the time, it was about 300 bucks at Costco. I got it when they were getting rid of them at Best Buy, and I think I got it for 70 bucks. But technically, that was the very first pinball machine I owned. And I don't see a lot of people talk about the Zizzle games, but I still have it. I have it in the box. Once in a while, I set it up, and it's got a real famous saying called, Not so easy, is it, matey? You hear that over and over. So not to get away from Wheel of Fortune too much, David, but I was thinking after when I was watching the Pirates of the Caribbean show we did, I thought, God, I should have brought that up. So I have now brought it up. I, I never understood the, the relationship between the Zizzle product and uh, the, the the Stern Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, Disney was not <clears throat> hungry to have a pinball machine based on their on their baby. Um, and it, it was it was an awkward licensing uh, thing. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. Just like the star story on the Stern, they have a picture of the Johnny Depp poster on the front, but there's no voices or music from the game. It's its own stuff. And mm. there's a voice actor they hired that says, not so easy, isn't matey? Over and over and over and over and over to the point where you're just sick of it. But he's kind of it's kind of true because the game was hard, really hard. It was hard to make the shots very difficult. So it really wasn't that easy, matey, I will say. But I digress. I Thanks for letting me get that out, David. I want to get right back to Wheel of Fortune. So back in 2007... When I had, had purchased my first pinball machine, you were getting going on the Wheel of Fortune, which at the point, I don't think I even knew it was coming. But uh, tell us a little bit about that time for Stern Pinball and what you remember back in that, in the two, you know, middle 2000s, 2006, 7. Well, we were heading, you know, Stern was a, a victim like a lot of other companies. We were heading to a, a societal financial meltdown, which was coming right on the horizon. In 2008, it really hit. And since pinball machines had become more of a collector's item than something being operated by operators, they were more subject to pressures on, let's call it discretionary income. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to buy what? So at at the time when Wheel of Fortune was started, there were still a a full staff at Stern. There were a bunch of programmers. There was uh, Keith Johnson who worked on Wheel of Fortune was there. Lonnie was there. I think the programmer for uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. uh, (laughs) Help me out here. Um, Dwight Sullivan. Dwight. Dwight Sullivan. The lovely Dwight Sullivan. Now, he was still there. um, And was Lyman there? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He probably was. So they had some really good programming talent. Uh, They had a bunch of designers. 
Um, John Borg was there and Dennis was there. I'm not sure who else. So they had a full staff and they were, uh, you know, making games. And uh, they had enough slack to take Family Guy and reskin that as Shrek. That that takes a lot of effort. It takes uh, programming and yep. and dots and art and lots of lots of stuff. So uh, things were moving right along, but the market was softening. It, they got into 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 trouble. So Wheel of Fortune suffered for that. Then we can talk about that. But it you know I think everybody knows Wheel of Fortune didn't get the final polish that it would eventually in a stern game uh they usually don't ship with final polish but they eventually get there because of the the crash you know in 2008 uh lots of people were laid off after the dust settled it was basically just lonnie <laughs> and mark galvez for dots and uh no playfield designers i think they i don't know how that went happened but they eventually uh either contracted or hired john borg back but dennis was gone dwight was gone um, was Lyman gone? I don't know. So, Will of Fortune did not get finished. You know, be- Keith was just gone before it could get done. And all the dots, all the art, the, the display art wasn't finished either. What I will say about this game is, I remember when it came out, I played it on route, and when I heard it was coming, of course, me and the, the few pinball friends I made, we all said, well, I hope they put a really cool wheel on it, they better, and they did. They delivered in spades yeah. on the wheel. The wheel on this game is perfect. It's a neat little miniature wheel, ex- exactly what you would expect to see. And I know for a fact that collectors that own this game, I've, I've never heard them say things except that they think it's great. Uh, there's someone that mm-hmm. posted on my last video that said he really liked the game and had it for a while. Mm-hmm. But back then, it was still a tricky deal because you had collectors and you had routes. Now it's more collectors, I would say, than routes. But I played this on route and I couldn't understand it. Yeah. It looked great. I've, I will say this again. I think it's the most beautiful pinball machine I've ever seen. The purple hues and pink hues and the whole game show feel, it's, it's top notch. But I didn't understand at all how to play it. And that was the tricky part. If you've got a collector, you've got time, you can figure it out. Whole different deal. But on route, and I think that's probably why it's looked at as somewhat of a failure, is because of its failure on route, so to speak. David, am I... I've got someone here who was there. Can you correct me on anything I've said that you feel is not quite accurate? Well, yeah, I, I could wax on about things I don't know anything about, but uh, you're right. I mean, by 2007 and moving into 2008, and even before that, the emphasis had really shifted in, in the hobby to the collector away from the operator. So if this failed in operations, uh, I, I you know didn't matter that much. But... For the collector, they really want a finished game. And I think that was part partially what was seen as making it less desirable. And then I don't think any of the collectors were really screaming for a Wheel of Fortune pinball as in terms of a, of a license. I mean, yes, everyone knows what it is, right? But who has that emotional attachment? You know, <laughs> you know Pirates of the Caribbean, Wheel of Fortune, you know. What, you know which one has the best... Uh, match for you know what you can do in a pinball machine it's it's gorgeous i agree and i think dennis did some really creative stuff yes gary i know has has blamed dennis for you know that what i've heard is the failure of this game as he says is because it doesn't have that traditional italian bottom which is two outlines and inlane and two flippers but this game i don't have a really good picture of it you can kind of see there if i switch over to the, the back side of the flyer but the bottom area it's got a different type of outlane drain where there's two different it can go down the outlanes in two different sections but it's got a huge flipper gap with two different flipper gap drains that but all that enables you to get free spins so if some of those get lit you get your ball back and but it, the whole flipper gap in the middle is the big difference and i think it's great and i don't i've never heard anyone complain about that you can see there's a lot of inserts involved in all of that you know there's inserts in those two little mini lanes in between the flippers and uh you, you know you get stuff back when that happens and there, there's all that free spin stuff that you can mm-hmm. accumulate so that even if you do a drain, you just get the ball back. So uh, it makes the bottom way more interactive. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, Dennis Dennis always tries to do something creative, something new, something interesting. This market, the collectors are not always open to that. Right. Uh, you know, they, they, they there's sort of this attachment to the classic Williams games of the mid and, and late late nineties, the beginning of the of the nineties and you know, that classic WMS era. You know, all those games are worth quite a bit now. There's the collectors, you know, want to see new themes attached to old Williams 
designs <laughs> to a degree. <laughs> you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to innovate in this space sometimes. Well, case in point, I don't think we touched on this in Pirates, but I believe the Stern Pirates of the Caribbean, that's where Dennis Norman wanted to put that that jet bumper, pop bumper down in the lower left corner. Yeah. And Gary wouldn't let him do it. But he did it in Jersey Jack's Wizard of Oz and everybody loves it. Collectors love it. So times change, I guess, and opinions change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong. Yeah. I don't think there's anything. I, I don't believe, you know, my, just my belief. I don't think the play field layout or the way the game flipped was, was the major problem. I think the biggest, I mean, the biggest problem is the fact that it's a wheel of fortune pinball. Nobody wanted that really. Who wanted that? Um, it's a different demographic. I think it came to be because a friend of Stern who shall go unnamed, uh, was big into licensing properties for gambling machines or he, he worked for a slot machine company and he's a friend of Stern. And so he licensed the wheel of fortune property for slot machines. And I think he added in the contract, you know, also we, we could extend this license to a, a pinball machine, mm. which then he, you know, shared with his friend, the wheel of fortune slot machine was phenomenally successful. But you think about it, what's a wheel of fortune? I mean, that's a pure gambling mechanism, right? You spin the wheel, you get something. Yeah. And uh, from, you know, for hundreds of years, you've had the spinning wheel and when it stops, you get something, you know? And so that's a pure random reward system, that, right? And so it's perfect as a gambling metaphor and the slot machine, they had big banks of them, 10 wheel of fortune terminals with all these old ladies pumping, you know, money into them. And uh, the, the that was a wonderfully successful gambling thing. Pinball companies have been running away from gambling for, you know, they had to because yeah. they were illegal until uh, Roger Sharp helped convince the powers that be that they're games of skill. So it's real tricky when you're going to like introduce the notion of, of like a gambling mechanism back into pinball. But I mean, it's, it's the TV show, right? And so this is very faithful, probably too faithful. I mean, the way the rules are integrated and try to match up, you know, with flipping a ball <laughs> with flippers in it and trying to integrate that into the flow of, of, of the game and solving puzzles. I mean, you don't, you only indirectly control this puzzle thing, but a whole lot of programming went into getting that puzzle thing to work. Yes, which I think that's one of the problems. Yeah, well, there's a finite amount of time. It's a zero sum game. You know, you only have so much time. You got to spend it wisely. Yeah. Keith made all that puzzle stuff work and it's pretty nifty, but it is a little obscure as to, you know, what am I doing here? I mean, you know, it, it, I think it follows. I mean, if we watch it, I think it does follow the basic shoot the flashing shots, but you're not really doing it with, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm just shooting flashing shots. Well, I had the hardest time understanding how what you do when you hit the contestant and what prize you get. And someone finally explained to me if they're flashing, you get what's on their wheel. But in my last show, I think I talked about that and I still didn't get the prize I thought sometimes. So I'm not sure. It's It was very hard to understand. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. I, at some point, the integration uh, with the theme and with the assets of the show was really quite remarkable. Yeah, and you have custom voice call outs from Pac Sajak. Well, that's it. That's a little known fact. Uh, Wheel of Fortune had been adapted to a number of products, including the slot machine. And Pat was never involved. And I don't know what magic occurred, but he agreed to record stuff for us. And they were shooting some milestone thing at Radio City Music Hall in New York. It might have been the Wheel of Fortune 25th or 30th anniversary show or something like that. And so he was in New York when we had the session. And uh, in a good mood and very cooperative and recorded hundreds and hundreds of lines. We, he also recorded some custom lines for his own personal version of the, of the pinball machine. And then we had, we also got his announcer. I think it's Charlie O'Donnell, mm -hmm, right? The, the wheel of fortune announcer. And we recorded a couple hundred lines from him. So between the two of them, we just nailed it. I mean, it, it really sounds like the TV show. But it's, it's custom speech that supports the flow of the game. So, yeah, it's pretty nifty. And no, Vanna didn't say a thing, but Vanna doesn't say. I mean, we could have recorded any random woman and said it was Vanna White because, you know, who knows what Vanna sounds like? She hardly ever talks. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a photo courtesy of Jay Stafford at the Internet Pinball Database, IPDB.org, uh, that I took of the assembly line of Wheel of Fortunes uh, going on almost 14 years ago. 
and then a picture of the Whitewood. And anyone that isn't in the world of pinball, the Whitewood is an example of the, the first build of the game that the mechanical engineer and designer works out. So this is a neat photo from Jay Stafford as well at IPDB.org of the Whitewood. And uh, I don't know, I, I don't know why they call it white. I mean, it's not, it's wood, but it's not really white. Well, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, this has got a lot of writing and stuff on it. I mean, basically it's, it, yeah, you could, I suppose you could call it a maple wood because that's what it is. It's maple plywood. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, it, it's just white, like a white piece of paper. It's, it's typically nothing. In a lot of cases, you'll get a flipping version of the game. It doesn't even have the inserts cut out of it yet. So it's really just a blank, a blank play field with flippers, slingshots, pop bumpers, and some ramps on it. And that's what you use initially to test. You know, Gee, I think this stuff should be here. Yeah. And then you flip it and you go, well, if it were over a quarter of an inch. Well, when you say that with a whitewood, that means you're going to have to take parts off of it. You're going to have to put some Bondo in the holes. You're going to have to redrill things. I mean, uh, it's a, the first play field, depending on how adventurous you've been in pinball design, could be a battlefield. You know, and, and, and ideally, if you have enough time, you iterate until you get something you know that, that is uh, novel, a little new, but a lot of fun, has flow, has uh, the difficulty where it should be, you know, the shots that you make off the tip of the flipper as opposed to the sweet spot of the flipper. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into being Steve Ritchie or Dennis Nordman. Yeah, you start with this and then you get that. You get that. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is a, a glitzy, fun thing. And it even has the bobbleheads. And then the bobbleheads are, you know, people at Stern, Lonnie Rob. <laughs> as much as I played this game, the two things that I have found that I never look at is that bonus wheel that's on the middle left play field, which is integral, but I just, I, I, my eyes never go there. They're always going to the big wheel and the characters. And the other part is that unfortunate dot matrix display, the mini one, I never look at it. I, I, and it's there giving me info, but my eyes just don't go there. Well, that, that was a comment that I had during development, and I, I really thought it was a missed opportunity. I mean, we uh, this is the beginning, right? That's just a little dot matrix display, and I think there was something similar in uh, Poker Tour had something like that as well. But it's an opportunity to, to talk to the player and give them timely information that they have a chance of seeing without having to break eye contact with the play field and, and look up at the back glass. Right. Uh, but it really to my mind was never used much i mean it, there's there's stuff there but if we watch when you play it's usually you know just stuff it's it's not it's not the conduit of timely information that i thought it should be and i, I think that's again that zero sum game where keith was spending his time with the puzzles and uh, the rules and it, trying to wrap a pinball machine or around a 22 minute television show which you know he does, but I, th I think the whole, the pinball activity suffers a little bit. You know, I, I've been involved in, in other projects where, you know, now we have high def screens and we stick them literally on the play field, like aliens, even the Hobbit or, or Pirates of the Caribbean sticks one below the, below the arch. Uh, and anything that gives information to the player in a, in a way that they can ab absorb it and still keep the ball live is, you know, I, th I think a potential for changing the activity of pinball. I mean, everything about pinball, modern pinball versus the electromechanical pinball, you know, what does having a screen and a, and a microprocessor do for this activity? Uh, the classic games that everybody loves from that time, from the Williams time, is that they figured out what to do with the processor and the display. They repurpose inserts, they repurpose mechs, they pose whole new games, modes, right? Uh, now, now you should be doing this, and now you should be doing this for big points. And none of this was possible to convey very well in an electromechanical machine. So once they figured out what to do with a microprocessor in a pinball machine, you have a set, you know, have a the, the most recent golden age of pinball. You know, that plus more powerful flippers, which allow you know more interesting ramps and orbits and things on the playfield. Uh, yeah, you get a machine that's fundamentally different than some kind of Gottlieb pinball from 1978 or 1980 even i would like to ask you to go back in time in your mind as best you can to 2007 and try to take us with you and and let us be there beside you like a fly on the wall can you tell us a story about what you remember 
when you got this job and you started getting information on the game. Can you remember any of the discussions or anything about the game development that we might not know? Wow. Um, this was mm, maybe my fourth one now. Now that I'm back and I'm doing pinball machines. So I'm, I'm feeling more comfortable. It's my second Dennis Nordman. And, and you can look at this, you know, this is not a simple, look at all the different ways the ball can move around here. This is not a simple play field by any means. Um, and then I, I don't think I'd worked with Keith before. And, uh, you know, my relationship with the games is much more keyed to my client. And my client typically is the programmer, not as much the play field designer. I mean, they will come in depending on, on which one it is and, you know, have pointed requests. But my day to day is with the programmer. I mean, he's structuring the rules and the events, you know, what what needs sound is going to come from the rule implementation. And then I give him sounds. I got to make sure that he's actually calling them and calling them in the right way. This was complicated, right? I mean, yeah, look at this. What kind of sounds do you need for the prize bank? What kind of sounds do you need for the bonus wheel? There's four rounds. There's the game with the wheel and and there's the thing with the contestants um, and all that's beyond just the motion of the ball around the play field. So I always start, if you go back to that Whitewood uh, picture, if you have it, that's what I start from. I start from inserts, right? Because if there's an insert, there's probably going to be a sound because that thing is not lit and then it's going to be lit. And when it lights, it, you probably want a sound to go along with lighting that. But then everywhere an insert is coupled with a switch like uh, MU over on the left, over by the bonus wheel, there are two stand-up switches and yes. two inserts. Now, I'm not sure. M U L. <laughs> I can't even spell what it. it's multi-ball. Okay, it's it's spelling multi-ball, right? So you're gonna want a sound every time you hit one of those and you light the insert. Uh, and then if you hit that lit insert, you want a different sound because we want to let the player know, oh yeah, you hit that. Of course, you've hit it before and so it doesn't mean much, but you know, we are keeping track of what you're doing. Um, so that structures my work. I, I bring it all, I, I wrestle all the complexity with a big list, big piece of paper and I write down and try to keep track of, let's see, all, all of these inserts, shoot again, you know, that's going to be the extra ball when that gets lit. Uh, then the, the bigger red inserts are all jackpots. So I know I'm going to you know, need to have big fanfares for those. Um, then the other obvious thing is just where there are switches, it, switches and inserts. So look where all the rollovers are, right? There are rollovers on the return lanes that feed the flippers. There are rollovers uh, on the orbits so that you know, the pin game knows where the ball is, you know, when it's making that that thing. And there's a certain kind of sound that I always want to make. I think of those as traveling sounds, right? The ball is traveling. Sure. And so I want to make a much more continuous traveling sound that somehow goes with the theme. You know, I, what's the traveling sound for Wheel of Fortune? Gee, it's not as obvious. It's not obvious. As opposed to you know, hitting a stand-up. Well, that's a that's a an, an impact kind of thing. And so there's a, a totally different sound that you'd make for those kind of switches as opposed to all the rollovers. I mean, the bottom arch of this, look at it. There's, there's three... There's six, seven, eight. There's eight different switches involved in that bottom arch. That's a lot. And it's important. It's important that the player, with their eyes closed, can tell which one of those switches, you know, so they can understand where the ball is rolling. Um, maybe they're in two-ball, multi-ball, and they're, they're busy working, you know, at the top of the play field. And yet, they'd like to know that a ball, you know, head, headed toward the drain. So, you want it. That's my thinking, is is trying to get my inventory, my list of, gee, what do I need to create? And those are all base level stuff. Really, those don't involve the rules much, right? Then when you get into rules, uh, how many times, you know, there are rules like how many times do you have to hit something before you qualify it? Maybe you have to hit it three times. And so you're going to make a sound and then a progressive sound that says, oh, you've hit that thing the second time. And the third time, you just say, hey, you've qualified something. You've lit something somewhere else which means you now are primed to do a thing go to a mode start a hurry up raise the multiplier for the play field yeah there's all kinds of possibilities uh, and that's where i have to deal with uh, the programmer or maybe he wrote it down <laughs> it happens every once in a while and you get a rules document <laughs> you're leaving out the best part though david mm. and that's that you 
will work on these things. And then guess what? Something changes. Something goes away. <sighs> and next thing you know, that sound you worked on. Oh, yeah, we don't have that anymore. We took that out. Yeah. Well, I, I try to work strategically. You know, if, if an area of, of the rules look a little bit funky to me, I'll just stay away from there for a while. I'll work on some <laughs> stuff over here. Uh, unless somebody's asking me, you know, hey, hey, could we have something for that? Oh, okay, sure. Right. Uh, because, I, yeah, it's enlightened self-defense. Um, otherwise, you don't want too much stuff you spent time on ending up on the floor. So with that, let's talk about oh, the trips. Some of these. <laughs> <laughs> with time on on the floor, I and I have my first question is you can see up in the top upper left of the playfield, there's a big thing that says win fabulous trips. Yeah. Now in a talk at the Northwest Pinbone Arcade Show, you mentioned that they're called stupid trips. Well, they're silly trips. I mean, they're, they're almost joke trips, right? Uh, some of them are, are desirable. Some, but in in the pinball, we we made the trips kind of like mad magazine trips you know mm -hmm. go off and do something crazy here wheel of fortune you've won this fabulous trip to go find bigfoot <laughs> that's one of the trips All right uh, another one of the trips was to go to pamplona and get pelted with tomatoes because they they do that or no it was the running of the bulls i guess yeah yeah so yes your your reward is the running of the bulls so let me interrupt because i want to drive this point home really hard but for instance on this game okay back in chicago and you're not in chicago you're out here in seattle mm -hmm. and so they sit around at a table and they think okay we got these trips well let's see how about we go okay africa we'll go with i know area 51 yeah that's funny the aliens you know bigfoot chicago hey how about the pinball hall of fame yeah that sounds good so then they come up with a list of 13 places you can take this trip and then they send you an email david we need music for 13 locations and of course you're thinking 13 locations i have to write a theme i got to come up with this whole thing so for that one word that was tossed out over a conference table, you could spend a week coming up with this tune. And then yeah. out of those 13 trips, how many ended up in the game? Not more than five. Because when you implement a trip, it's a mode. These are 13 modes, you know, and, and I was not familiar. I hadn't worked with Keith before. You know, I've worked with Keith since. And uh, so now I understand the, the deep water we were getting into, but at this point, I you know I didn't know, so yeah. And if you say you're going to have a trip, that means it's a mode. What does that mean? Well, it's going to have scoring events. It's going to have different rules. It's going to have different objectives. Because you, you know, what's the point of having 13 modes if you do the same thing in every one of them? So Keith was going to have to come up with 13 variations of you know what you do on the play field while playing this mode that hopefully ties into the the theme somehow. So Australia has the boomerang shot and i guess when you shoot like a lid insert over here then, then you have the notion of the boomerang and then ending up over here so your next shot's going to be someplace else on the play field so you have to figure out where the boomerang went and find the lid insert and shoot for that something like that uh, and then you're going to need dots you're going to need original art animations you need a background that runs during the course of the mode and there's going to be several kinds of scoring so you're going to want to have some kind of picture that goes with that scoring event and then you're going to need a, a mode summary how well did i do while i was in that mode and so you want at least a still and some stuff so you can format a score and stick that up there and you're going to want to sound for that to hey pay attention i'm just showing you you know how well you did so every mode that has all those features times 13 mm -hmm. so all of that did not get done <laughs> I, and I was looking through, I have a recording of all the, all the dot animations in the game at, as of some point. And uh, I only found about five that, that are, have dots that have animations. And I, I did tunes. I did all the tunes. Well, and that is what makes my heart ache for you, David, because I know what it means to creatively work so hard on something and then find out it's been cut. And yeah. you also are not paid by the hour. You that's not the way it works. Or not not even the piece. Right. So <laughs> for someone to just come up with a name, then by just writing that name down, say Area 51. Yeah, Area 51. They have created a week of work for you, possibly, to score and create, you know, you have to research, well, what should Area 51 music sound like? Okay, it's the aliens. Well, then you gotta research themes and try to come up with ideas and then you test things. I mean, it is a huge process to make a song. Because my business partner makes songs. I know what it takes. And 
that's the sad part is that you come up with this stuff and then someone says, eh, can't do it. And, you know, nobody is aware of the time. You know, and of course, what, what we wish when we're on this end, we wish people would really just know what they want before they ask me to do it because they know my time is valuable, right? Yeah, good luck with that. Listen, <laughs> I, I, you, I didn't even tell you, there, there's two other things here. Uh, one of them was kind of fun because Dennis had this notion in his mind. Uh, Dennis has a lot of notions. And he knew that there were people at Stern who played musical instruments, right? We all know Steve Ritchie plays guitar. Sure. And uh, J- Joe Blackwell, I believe that's his last name, but Joe was a, a, a world-class support guy at Stern. Turns out he was a good, he's a guitar player. And there were other people who played. And so Dennis had it in his mind for for the tunes and stuff. If I could come up with things that we could we could abstract a band out of the people who worked at Stern and practice some of these tunes. And at, at the expo that happened after the reveal of Game of Wheel of Fortune, that the Stern band could play the tunes that I had written for Wheel of Fortune. Oh, what an idea. What an idea. Sounds good on paper, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, but... Uh, toward that end, I did invoke the talents of Joe Blackwell, okay. who turned out to be a very good blues artist. And uh, so I came up, uh, one of the trips was to Chicago, home of the blues. And we recorded, I recorded, I wrote a tune, a little blues tune, and I sent him a music minus one track. So I had everything except the guitar. And uh, then he played that and recorded that and sent that back to me and I then mixed that with the original track and that's in the game. But that's a lot of fussing. You know, if I lived in Chicago, I suppose organizing the band would have been a possibility, but sure. from this distance, 1700 miles now that was not going to happen. So, any case, but that one got done. Uh, but I don't think that one's in the game. I don't think Chicago's in the game. Might be, but I don't see the dots for it. Um, and then the other one was they had surfing in Hawaii. We're going to send you off for surfing in Hawaii. So they wanted surf music. And so I wrote some surf music and I took it at that time between 2000 and this time uh, when I, before I was, you know, fully, I was kind of retired for about five years. One of the things I wanted to do during my retirement was to learn how to really play guitar. I played bass guitar, but I didn't play guitar very well. I'm a keyboard player and I really wanted, I always had guitar in me. I wanted to learn how to play guitar. So I had, I had a bunch of electric guitars and acoustic guitars and I had been working on that so when it came time to do the surf music uh, I thought oh I could write my own version of Wipeout you know that's the first turn you know when I was a kid and I was starting to be in bands that was one of the first tunes that you learned and that that's how you you know learn to be a musician from records and everybody played Wipeout it was a great uh, instrumental yeah it starts out with hey Wipeout exactly and then, and then the drums and yeah Yep. And so it was a good rock instrumental. And so I, I wrote something like that. And I, I played guitar because at that time I didn't have very good synthetic guitars. Not like I have now in 2007. My, I, so I, I played guitar on that track and I was really proud of it. And then they sent some of the music to review. Sony owns Wheel of Fortune. And uh, that one came back. No, no, we don't want that. We want it to sound more like the Beach Boys. Mm. <laughs> I will stay up. You know, so... I had to, uh, I had to do that one again, making it sound uh, tempo de Beach Boy, make it sound more like the Beach Boys, some kind of Beach Boys instrumental, which means that wouldn't be the Beach Boys at all because the Wrecking Crew was the were the inst- the people who played the instruments mostly on Beach Boys records, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so I I had to do that one again, and I think Hawaii. I don't think Hawaii made the game either. So not only did I have to do thirteen of these, I had to do. Yeah, extra stuff recording live musicians and then do one of them again. And you're not getting paid by the hour. I have to make that point. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay to do a contract deal because I'm in production like you. And if you do it, you have to make sure who you're doing with what really respects your time. And I think sometimes in these things, nobody's thinking about anyone else's time because they got their own problems. And that's the tricky thing about creative development. Yeah. And really for, for me, I mean, it's doubly bad because yes, I'm a distance collaborator and I do sound. So sound is invisible and then I'm not there. So it is really a classic case of out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And I have to do a lot of things in the collaboration to constantly, you know, I'm here, wait, I'm here, you know, we got to get these things under control. Right. And because I'm not there and because most, most of my collaborators don't think that much about sound. 
and most of them like it and they they know what they like when they hear it but they mostly don't know the detail and so collaboration has to i have to find ways of, of you know working with them yeah they can tell you if it's turned off if it's there eh. yeah well it's fair i mean it's fair why should they i mean yeah. it's, it's a very uh specific domain with its own vocabulary and, and issues and stuff and you know why should they i but I, I have to be very mindful of that fact when working with them and come up with ways to uh, iterate and, and communicate, you know. Uh, yeah. I, basically, I work by example. I don't try, I don't ever try to describe anything with words. I will, you know, make something or I will find something. I said, you want something like this? And then they can say, oh, yeah, that's what we had in mind. Or, oh, no, 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 no. We want something completely different. We don't know what that is, but we don't want that. I make this point a lot on David's behalf and my own behalf to to collaborators out there is just remember when you work with people like us, just remember our, of our time and we love doing what we do and we love, you know, in David's case, the music and sound is that's his life. And in my case, what I do, I love it. But just remember that, especially if it's a project deal, just be mindful of the creative time and just try to do it the best job you can before you tell us what to do to just have that you've thought it through as much as you can. Good luck. I don't know if I can word that any better, David, but that's what, what I would say is just remember us people out here. You know, anybody who'll be watching this so often, you know, it's like preaching to the choir. Yeah. Uh, the other people we would have to like drag into the room and, and duct tape them to a chair and say, now watch this. <laughs> There's an important message here for you. <laughs> yeah, well, at least it's there. But I, I have to say to those of you who are watching and listening with this show, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, is we're going to make history and all this hard work david put into creating these tunes for these 13 trips we're going to play all of them <laughs> and so those of you out there that own a wheel of fortune you're going to hear the deleted scenes the bonus materials that have never before been out there and that at least david is something to where we can honor your hard work and at least it can be heard well, thanks. because that's half of it is you make this music so people can hear it and now we're going to do that so Here's what we're going to do. We've got a bunch of audio tracks of music to play, and I've got it ordered with the first four tracks that are in the game, and then we'll get into the ones that didn't make the game. So, David, what I'd like to do is play a track, and we'll just listen, and then at the end, you can comment uh, about it, and uh, whether it's a story or anything you have to say, and then when you're done, I'll play the next track. Okay. So this is the first track, and this is from one of the silly trips to Africa. Big money, big money, big money, big money. question right away david is that your voice singing the wheel oh yeah oh yeah all right yeah, that's a real kalimba fest <laughs> kalimba is, a, is an african instrument it's a, a little box and it's got a bunch of little metal springs and you play it with your fingers by flipping them and, and twanging them okay well the notion for this one this is one of my favorite ones i'm glad they used it uh wheel of fortune is a franchise you know we have the u.s version of wheel of fortune but after sony bought it they exploited it all over the world there's a french version of wheel of fortune with its own pat sajak and uh and uh, ukrainian i mean wheel of fortune there are many many flavors of that show in many localities and when they came up with this one my notion was well what if there was pick an african nation they change so often but pick an african nation and what if they had their own wheel of fortune show and so it's the african music and then uh the thing, the thing they're chanting in the background is big money, big money, big money, big money, big money. <laughs> Wheel. Wheel. I like <laughs> big that. Big money, big money, big money, big money, big money. Wheel. <laughs> and so I, I had a good time. That was a lot of fun. All right. And here is our next track. This is Australia. <laughs> Thank you. 
What I will just add before you comment on this, David, is that I'm not a musician, but I know there's a certain amount of like a bars you go through. And then usually what I notice is you'll go into a kind of a solo, like a little little solo towards the, the latter part. And that's the kind of stuff that when you're playing the pinball game, you might not notice it. But it's one of those intangibles that if it's not there, then the music could somehow just it doesn't have enough change because you need it to change. So it's great that we can even take the time to hear those little those little moments that you put into it. Well, I'm not sure on, on these modes since some of them didn't get implemented. And I forget now whether these were were a goal oriented modes or timed modes. And I think I hedged my bets. So there's a definite second half to the tune. Hmm. And if, if in fact it's a 30 second timed mode, if you're hearing that, that means your timer's nearly done. Okay. It, and it, as a cue in these, it's rather subtle. Uh, ones I write now, slightly more, more experience. I, I make those, I make the shift much more obvious. I'll go to a really short loop with something that, you know, kind of goes like that. And so, you know, Ooh, we're running out of time. That one features another ethnic instrument. I was uh, really researching world instruments. And so to be totally authentic, that has the didgeridoo. Yeah, that's what, yeah, I can hear that. Yep. Which is a clay tube. And they, these guys, these native guys who do this practice circular breathing. So they can continue to blow and still continue to breathe somehow. And so they do these drones that just go on and on and on and they never take a breath. And that ooh, 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 stuff. And it's... uh. Yeah. So that was fun. And, and then I have, you know, I have to worry about uh, contracts that I sign with all clients hold my feet to the fire if I infringe on some kind of copyrighted material. So I had to do some digging to see if Waltzing Matilda was a folk tune that was old enough that I didn't have to worry about getting nailed for copyright infringement because otherwise we, you know, you can use it, but if you use it, then the remedy is much more expensive than licensing it in the first place correctly. But I'm, i I did the research then and I'm pretty sure this was a, a folk tune that was outside the limit of copyright public domain. All right, moving on to the third track. This is a trip to Nashville. It's my homage to uh, Chet Atkins. Who is Chet Atkins? I've not heard of him. Oh, Chet Atkins is, is one of the great soloists and session players of Nashville for 20 years. He had this great style uh, that was quite recognizable and he could, he could play the strings right off a guitar. He, he was one of the, there, you know, it's, there's a, so many good instrumental players in Nashville, but he was sort of like the king of guitar going way back though you know 50 60 years ago now she's in the, the 50s and uh, in the 60s and 70s it was chet atkins and he was the man he could play he could play that style right that was cool all right our fourth track is if you win a trip to hawaii and we talked briefly about that this would be the version two of more like the beach boys Did I get that wrong? That sounded more like Wipeout. Yeah, no, no, that's it. That's it. That's the more Beach Boys version. I for, I forget what the other one was like. Okay, but that's still my playing guitar. I mean, there there are a few recordings that exist in nature of uh, my attempts at playing guitar. I, I'm happy with that. That that sounds, you know, I think that captures it. And that's a real guitar, right? You're playing a real guitar, not a synth guitar. That's my Strat. Wow, plugged into a, a box, you know, a little effects box. Yeah. Well, now we have reached the point in the show where we are going to be listening for the first time in history to the long lost missing tracks from Wheel of Fortune. And we're going to first start with a trip to Area 51.
So I have to ask right away that is that 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 electronic kind of electric the the instrument that I don't know what it's called, but it's where you kind of are almost like in the air. Yeah, you play uh, antennas. Yes. Yeah, you basically have two antennas. One one antenna is for pitch. The other antenna is for volume. And uh, that was a device developed in the twenties. Yep. 1920, right? By a guy named Leon Theremin. And uh, it's incredibly difficult to play. And that wasn't a real theremin. That just sounded like one. And I'm doing a lot of fancy MIDI stuff to make, you know, get all those nice continuous tones. Uh, the, the, you know, you could have a whole show on the theremin. This is a remarkable story about the instrument and, and the one woman who could really, there's one woman named Clara Rockmore. And, you know, look her up on, on Google. She was a phenomenal theremin player. And, Really, there's almost been nobody else who could play the thing and, and make it sound. She was a virtuoso. I mean, she'd been a violinist and she applied that that stuff to it and she made it sound great. In any case, you know, the theremin is your obvious go to. If we're looking for F, for uh, world instruments to evoke something, I, you know, you, yeah, Area 51, flying saucers, theremins. The instrument of choice for the aliens. <laughs> I am a big fan of Mannheim Steamroller and Chip Davis is the the front man of Mannheim Steamroller and they did a Halloween album and there's a song called Creatures of the Night that if you want to look up the music video of that on YouTube, it it plays that Thurman and he's like right there playing. It's cool. It's just cool to watch him. It's like he's playing something that you don't, it's just in the air. It's like, like you said with the antennas, it's really cool. You can't go wrong with the piano. You hit a key, you're going to get the pitch. You're going to get the note, right? Uh, violin's tougher because there are no frets. And so somewhere, <laughs> somewhere on that neck is the thing I want, but at least I'm feeling the neck and, and the neck is wider at the bottom and smaller at the top and there's physical resistance. And so while that's hard, the theremin, you're just air, you're just doing this. And when you see how she did it, she just is doing little things, you know, and getting all this stuff out of it. It was, it was tiny little gestures resulted in, in big stuff. It, it's a hard instrument. Moving on to our next long lost music track from Wheel of Fortune, the pinball machine. This silly trip is a trip to spend some time with Bigfoot. You have to go back into Dennis's previous games. Dennis uh, is associated with Bigfoot somehow. And in Whitewater, I think there's a hulking kind of guy. And, and there's always sort of the joke that that's Dennis. Yep. Right. And so, yeah, the, the trip was, you're going to the Northwest to search for Bigfoot. That was the trip. I'm living in the Northwest. So that was sort of my uh, world music for what it's like to be out in a Northwestern forest. This might very well be the only Bigfoot theme in existence. (laughs) (laughs) Our next track is a trip to Chicago. This is a blues based track. You talked about a little bit earlier with the guitar from uh, it was Joe Blackwell, correct? Who played the guitar? Yep. Very good guitar. Definitely a very live. Yeah, Joe's a good player. No synth there. Nope. And, and the Mighty B3, that's my contribution. I mean, when I played in lounges and rock bands, that I, I played stuff like that. So, you know, that's like falling off a lot for me to knock out a 12-bar blues. And very cool. Joe, you know, the, the, the whole lead line, that was all him. I, I just gave him a backing track, and he came up with that very quickly, probably in, you know, in an hour. So that was great. I, I was really pleased. And I don't think that's in the game which is makes me sad. Our next long lost track from the additional wheel of fortune trips is a trip to Jamaica. It's obviously the pan drums, the steel, those are basically tuned, tuned oil drums. And it's kind of, if you, if you're old enough, you watch the the first like James Bond film that, that takes place in Jamaica. There, there's a lot, there's a lot of that music in the background. One thing to keep in mind about all this is 
not only did I need to come up with these things that are evocative of the theme, but they all have to be what I call pinball music. They have to be energetic. Everything has to be, you know, up here. Yeah. So you have to find something in Jamaica, which is like up here. <laughs> so they're all constrained by, by that. They, you know, you're going from main play to a mode and you want that mode to be more exciting than main play was. And then main pay is pretty exciting. So that next level up is what I was trying to achieve. Our next long lost track is a trip to Mexico. That's a great track. I really like the horn and the horn kicks in there. I would sort of forgotten that one. You know, that's the obvious cliche. When I lived in Chicago, we used to go to a Tex-Mex restaurant and it had the wor- just the best food. And it was this kind of little hole in the wall. And every table had the red and white vinyl tablecloths. And coming out of the ceiling was this endless stuff that was a great deal like that. I said, well, I'll make something like that. And cliche is not always bad. I mean, it's your thing and it's your little progressions of the notes that you're doing. And I forgot that I shifted to the to the Mexican disco for the second half. <laughs> <laughs> it was that pinball energy you were talking about. I, I heard it I'm like, yep, pinball machine energy there. A lot of the Mexican stuff is in three. I mean, that's basically a waltz, a fast one, you know, it's one da 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 yan da 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 yan da da you know. And so I, I needed to, sh- I felt the need to shift out of that back in the, in, into a te- rhythmic territory that was more familiar. Our next trip is a trip to Pamplona? Yeah, Pamplona, Spain. Spain, okay. Spain. You're taking a trip for the running of the bulls. I heard the bull. You can hear the bulls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the crowd roars as people are getting run over and gored and so on. <laughs> I, I like the running of the bulls. You know, Spain has sort of a, uh, a questionable, uh, you know, thing in terms of animals rights and, and bullfighting and stuff. I, it's, it's like, Ooh. so the running of the bulls is cool. Cause they just, for some reason, willingly run in front of herds of bulls with antlers. I mean, it's just, and people get hurt every year. I mean, it's like, okay. Had to be there, but yep. so yeah, yeah. You have the you have the high Spanish trumpets and the bulls and the crowds going nuts. I thought that was evocative. It totally works. Our next track, uh, it's called Sturgis with Organ. The guys with Harleys go every year to Sturgis. Was it North Dakota? Yeah, yeah. So you know, you went a trip to North Dakota and Sturgis and the running of the Harleys. I did not know Sturgis was a place, so I've learned something new. Well, see, in, in COVID time, they didn't defer. They still had it, right? All these biker guys went in the middle of the, of the pandemic and uh, you know, said, we don't care. And I've never heard anything like they were super spreaders or anything horrible happened. I, I don't know what happened as a result of that. But yeah, th- these are uh, America's last individualists. And uh, 
Yeah, of course you do something like Steppenwolf. <laughs> it was nice and rocking. Good energy. This is our last track I have here, David, on the long lost Wheel of Fortune tracks that didn't make the game. And this is a trip to Las Vegas to visit the Pinball Hall of Fame. Very appropriate. I think those are your electromechanical sounds. <laughs> I wasn't sure because you asked me for those for Transformers. Oh. And I was thinking about that because, yes, when David did Transformers, I had an electromechanical pin machine called Volley, and he asked if I would record the chimes for him, which I did. But this was before that, so I'm thinking those aren't. They could have come from a library. I mean, that's the bane of my... Uh, entire career is, is whenever they show or include a pinball machine in any kind of form of entertainment, a movie or a TV show, they can show a modern machine and they always dub in those sounds, electromechanical sounds, something they haven't made for 40 years. They do. Because uh, that's what registers for people. And it also clears the, uh, you know, maybe in a pinball machine, I was playing something copyrighted that we had clearance for, but then they would have to get clearance for it. Or maybe they're worried about getting clearances from Stern or whoever the client was. I don't know. But for whatever reason, they never, I've, I've never, ever seen a pinball machine featured in anything that had the, the, the sounds that it actually makes. My work. I've never seen that. <laughs> so it's like, okay, fine. But if you listen to that track, I made the pinball stuff rhythmic, like some kind of instrument that, that it comes in you know, as if you were playing some kind of electromechanical machine as a musical instrument. So that was fun. Yeah, my wife pointed my attention to a show she likes to watch. I don't remember the name. It's a current show. She said, hey, they're playing a pinball machine. Do you want to see it? I said, yeah. So she showed me. It was this very long scene where this this guy and this girl are having a conversation while they're playing Williams Cyclone, which is a game I own. And of course, like you said, the sounds of Cyclone chimes. were chimes. And I just thought, my gosh, really? Even Cyclone, which I don't know. That's just Williams. It's, it's just Williams Carnival music by Chris Graner. It's there's no license themes there, but I, I know that I'm sure they get into the editing. They don't even want to chance it. They're just safe. Well, I think there's two things at play. One is that that's just a sound meme. I mean, you see a pinball machine, you expect to hear that. Even though it hasn't done that for 50 years, you expect to hear that. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that in a lot of cases, the sound the pinball machine's making is pretty aggressive, even more aggressive than chimes. And, you know, you're, you're trying to have dialogue or, or you have a dramatic scene or something that the story that we're telling in audio for the pinball machine would be a tad distracting from the drama or the comedy or whatever they're trying to put forward. So, yeah, I, you know, the pinball EM sounds are, are more generic and I think less distracting. And they also just say pinball. Hey, look, pinball machine. Yeah. Ching, 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 ching. Like, of course, for me, it's like, ah, it doesn't sound like that. But of course, there's very few of us that are going to say that. <laughs> we're writing wrongs. I mean, finally, it can be heard. <laughs> <laughs> I hope uh, all of you listening enjoyed that special exclusive trip down memory lane of Wheel of Fortune with unearthing music never before heard by the general public and David I'm really glad that we can now share your hard work with everyone and they can listen to it we're going to move into the part of the show where I'm going to play the game and we'll continue to talk about the sound and music and I want to draw some attention and David I hadn't shared this with you before but you're looking at a simulated version of Wheel of Fortune and these simulated tables are created by people for no money and they spend a ton of time and they do this for the love of the hobby and to share with others. It is 100% a donation type environment of this virtual pinball plane. And Wheel of Fortune, because it's not considered a big, big table, was undeveloped for many years. It was half done. Some some people had worked on it because you need people that know how to 3D model. I mean, they people build the models of the I mean, this is all done by people just because. And so the table was in a working state and there was a programmer I'd gotten to know on the forums at V Pinball. His name was DJ Rob X. And he is also the person that has updated this software to allow you to separate the music and the sound from the game, the flipper sounds and the music. And you can even play virtual pinball in 5-1 surround. He's built a 5-1 surround engine to where you can set that up on your computer running your virtual pinball machine. He is a big sound person and he's a programmer. And I wrote him a message about Wheel of Fortune. And I told him that it's a game I've always liked. And I asked him 
if he knew who worked on it or if he was interested in trying to you know help because i can't do that and he decided to work on it and i talked to him because the wheel didn't turn very well and he started integrating new code to make the wheel turn nicely and he was sending me beta versions and i was helping him test it so this game that i'm playing today i had a hand in helping see it get to its state it is today. And I really want to call out DJ Rob X. He's still around helping and doing things. But there's a huge community of people out there that make these virtual tables possible. And what I wanted to share with you, David, I would like your opinion on this, but some really sad news just happened this week. There are only a few websites where you can find these tables. There's about four. And one of them just shut down. And the owner posted that he is shutting the site down because there are too many individuals out there that are taking these tables and trying to sell them. Mm. Some big outfits are building virtual pinball machines based on computers and monitors, and they're adding all these tables to them, which these tables are free and they were made by people for free and they're selling them as part of the table. And this person was simply too upset about it. And he pulled the plug on the entire site and just said, there are too many greedy people out there and he's tired of seeing them steal. And it's a difficult thing because there are many people like me that I use these. I acknowledge the people that, that work on them. I appreciate it. And it's meant for enjoyment. And that's what I do here. But I was wondering, David, if you'd care to comment on what you think about the future of virtual pinball and being able to do things like this. The fact that whenever something like this is done by volunteers for no money, there are always others out there that will exploit it. Yeah. Well, I feel for these guys, you know, they're very motivated and they've created some beautiful stuff. And uh, then there are, entre you know, entrepreneurs who are taking that stuff and coupling it to something tangible. Yeah. A cabinet with a monitor and a computer and a thing. And because you can't easily steal that, they get money for that, right? But the reason they're getting money for that is due to the contribution of all these other people who worked for free. And somehow, because they put it out there for free, it's like, oh, look, we can exploit this free stuff. It's very difficult to put monetization pipelines in place it, it just is I, I did sounds for c64 games okay set the way back way back right yeah 1983 84 85 and uh you know I, everything that was on apple II and c64 and the pc you know you get one version out there and then everybody is figuring out a way to copy the discs and so of all the plays that were done on those things probably 10% were paid for, 90% were, you know, pirated copies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, digital stuff, because it's it makes copying trivial. I mean, you wouldn't copy a 300 page book. <laughs> you could, right? But it, it's too cumbersome. So you end up buying the book, but then you need a publisher to print the book. And so, you know, as the author, you're still screwed. But uh, yeah, digital stuff has just made IP difficult. Um, in a lot in, a, in so many cases that you know smart guys have figured out a way steam like i don't know of anybody who copies steam games i, I suppose it's possible right yeah but i don't know of anybody that does it and i know i know somebody well i know you and i know somebody else in, in missouri and he has a thousand steam games and he's paid for all of them yep, right so they have gotten money for that all the people who you know, and, and Steam takes takes a percentage of that because they're applying, they've got the platform, which, you know, makes stealing that hard. This table is just created for free by people so we can enjoy it and yeah. and be able to, to do like what we're doing here for the show. Do a simulation, talk about your sound. I want to really call out that there are a lot of wonderful people out there that design these pinball simulation tables. First and foremost, to preserve history, to create a way that these can be played. We can't all own a Wheel of Fortune machine. There, there are only so many out there. They don't keep making them. So this is a way forever that we can enjoy this game and many others and get a chance to play. And in this case, in the show, talk about what you did. So I just want to say to all of you out there that work on these, thank you, because they're wonderful. I mean, you look at this Wheel of Fortune. This Wheel of Fortune model is beautiful. Yeah, it, it is very faithful. It is gorgeous. Yeah, the, the detail is astounding. So let's play a little bit of this game and talk about the sounds so we can see it in action. So the first thing I have to do is put in my quarter. So that is the first sound, David. Any comments about the, the coin in the door sound effect? As always, I try to make it three things. Very noticeable. So you know that that actually worked because sometimes the coin doesn't always work in the mechanism. Two, I want it to be rewarding somehow. And three, just somehow be integrated with the theme of the game. And, and 
there's a there's a lot you know the theme for wheel of fortune you know it's, it's a tv production and they had some you know wacky sort of 80s sound effects so i, I kind of tried to stay within that all right i'm gonna start a game Exactly what you expect to hear. And here we are with the shooter groove, which is not something we played earlier. So David, would you care to comment on this shooter groove you created for the game? I like to keep them fairly short, almost annoying, because shooter grooves to my mind are, hey, put the bear down, plunge. <laughs> And there is a skill shot in this game, it's the toss-up, which I have never made that. And I, I mean, I made the shot, but then you have to hit the ramp, and that's the part I haven't done. So who knows, maybe we'll do it today. A little too much. The category for round one is on the map. One L, 45,000. Let's see, at this point, I really don't know what I'm doing. I, 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 okay, she called an L, I hit a shot, the wheel spun, but it's that understanding of the, the rules, and I played this a lot, but I really still don't know. Huh? Three R's in the puzzle. So if you, we want to get into the wheel has stopped, okay, and bankrupt, maybe that's why we heard that sound, because bankrupt came up in the center. But I don't know, I think I yeah. need to hit a shot to get bankrupt. But but I don't know. That's again hard to understand. J There's one J, seventy-five thousand. What do you think of the choice of the very nasally voices to call of I think that's Lonnie, I think? No, that's Keith. Keith is the one with the M J. Yeah, but I don't think that's Keith. I think that was voice talent. Oh, right, right. But it's supposed to be the Keith character. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it, it's sort of a cartoon approach. I mean, it, yeah. Keith doesn't sound that way. <laughs> but the way Keith sounds wouldn't be entertaining enough. Yep. One Z, 55,000. So I can solve the puzzle if I hit that shot next to the ramp. And I'm guessing if I solve the puzzle, I'll get the 60,000 that's under Maria because she's flashing. <laughs> Clearly won. The category for round two is... But I didn't plays. see the points. By the way, it's a prize puzzle. Okay, prize puzzle. Actually, I haven't lost a ball yet, David. You want that big, huge I know, I'm impressed. And, of course, now I'm going to lose a ball. Is lit. There should be at least one R, sixty thousand. Multi-ball is lit, so the music is yeah, changed. Yeah, so the music changed. Yeah. That's you on the guitar, right? Uh, that's from the library, I think. Okay. I don't play that much slide. There you go. Yes, there are some A's. Jack 
Bus. Double Jackpot. Keith Johnson from Chicago. You are correct. Triple Jackpot. Oh. Now I got a triple. I didn't get the quadruple. I know he says quadruple jackpot. Any thoughts, David, just watching me play? Any memories come back to working on it? Well, wow. Yeah, no, it's just like 2007. That's 13, 14 years ago. I'm like, huh. Two I in the puzzle. I just vaguely remember. L. There are four L's. Ah, you got a trip. I got a trip. Trip to Australia. Jackpot. Double jackpot. Tell us about yourself. I've won three air guitar titles. Hey, I play air bagpipes. The category for round three. There it is. The king of and after. Uh, so that's for you. The wheel stopped on bankrupt. Uh, so that's why I hear that sound. Big money. Yeah. Go for that toss up. Almost. Lonnie Rop from Scream and Holler, Kentucky. That's right. Yes, I am. And I'm proud of it. I was there once, accidentally. <laughs> is Lonnie really from Scream and Holler, Kentucky, David? He is not. He is an Iowa boy. All right. The, the joke yes, was, I mean, I knew Lonnie been. at a at a company in 1983. And then we hired him at IT. He was like our fourth employee or something. And let's see, from 83, I think, to 86, he still had his Iowa license plate. <laughs> he lived in Illinois, but he retained his Iowa license plate for a very long time. And, and that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about Lonnie. Well, so Lonnie's answer to the game where he says, yes, I am, and I'm proud of it. That might be kind of related to that. It kind of is. Yeah, yeah. He was he was from the... Is that the Buckeye State? I think so. T. I think there are some T's. Can I buy an A? There are three A's. Oh, I'll get big money in him. No free spin. Ninety thousand times fifteen. Yeah. There it is. Toss up. Category is pinball turns. Led by an eye. I think there's an eye. <laughs> So was that the ramp you had to make? I didn't make it. I hit the solve a puzzle Two shot, e's. so I missed it. P. Three P's. You did pool of applicants. Oh, Australia again. What is Australia again. Oh. The category 
for round four is Thing. Can't have too All many same. free spins. Can't have too many free spins. Wild card for a wild player. I think I had all those drop targets down. Okay, I have another chance. Locked up is King Ball turns. I got it! I got it! Let's move on to the puzzle. Well, the game didn't make a big deal out of it. it that didn't. stinks. I heard a little music change. There was kind of a music flourish. Yeah. But... yeah that's that's not what you should get for a super skill shot. Do you know if there's even a wizard mode in this game? Which, you know, you complete all the trips, you get a special... Oh, I, I don't know. There are, there are multi balls you haven't gotten to, so. Right. Uh, I don't think. I, I don't know. Let's do it. I awesome. doubt it very much since is the there's, there's a lot left on the table. Free spin, use it or lose it. Out of time. Sorry, folks. Well, what I would say to people Keep watching this... for a goodie bag of points. Oh. This is a different tune. Yeah. Okay, you, you got to keep the wheel spinning. Okay. There's something you got to be doing, and that's <laughs> not going to do it. Nope. I will say, if you ever get a chance to see this out in the wild, the wheel is beautiful. It's beautiful. That's why I would love to have this someday, just for that wheel. They had a, you know, they had a lot of control over that wheel. The so, for this up is you know, like that turn. one, you kept hitting targets, you'd speed up the wheel for big points. Time's up. Got a lot of chances. A lot of chances. <laughs> Okay, this is my last ball. I'm on a 10 ball game, so whatever happens, happens, and we're done. One S. 60,000. I'd like an L. There's one L. 60,000. to that wild card. Reality TV show. The category for round one is occupation. Nice non-flip. Maria Mercado from Hollywood. Yes, I am, but... Oh. We can give you an L, 30,000. That's it. Big points. Big points. And I'm on the, the top board. And you know what I find funny is there's no music for making a high score, which they could have yeah, used one of your tracks. They could have used one of your tracks yeah. that they had a bunch. It's odd. It's it's a very unfulfilling victory with just even no. I, I, mm. I use the, the Las Vegas one. It's one of those things that reminds me this game really was unfinished. I don't think it was yep. it was completed. 
So, which is a shame because it is a beautiful game and uh, I still, you know, who knows, maybe someday I might have it for a while just to admire the beauty of the real pinball machine over the simulation because it, it's, it's, it's awesome to look at and the wheel is super cool. Yeah, they worked hard on that mechanism and it really worked well and it was pretty. Um, and it was you know, used well by the rules. I, I like that a lot. Yeah. Is there anything else, David? Looking back? No, no. I think I think we covered this. I'm I'm very pleased to uh, be able to uh, get these things out there. You know, in these big collaborations, you start at the beginning and, and hope you're gonna you know get to the end, and sometimes you don't, and that's always it's always disappointing. But that you know, it's outside my control, yeah. way above my pay grade is is so what happened in 2008 i was just like oh okay uh, you did what you were asked to do well it's funny at that time i was i was telling carol with each project i mean i could see things weren't going well and i said you know i've done like four games i i don't think i, I don't think there'll be any pinball money you know maybe ever or soon or anything <laughs> and uh here we are 14 years later and uh i've got three clients and four projects and seven possible clients and yeah pinball came back big after a couple bad years it, it's remarkable where it is right now and i frankly with the introduction of high def screens and better amplification and things i think we're we're uh, entering a, another golden age of pinball because you have seven companies all competing with each other trying really hard to make something that will tickle your fancy uh, it's hard for a single company to compete with themselves, you know, and and competition since Jersey Jack started has really raised everybody's game. And so there's some there's some spectacular product that's been made in the last five years, and the next several years are going to be very exciting. I'm working with some, you know, they're not the first tier manufacturers. I'm not working with Stern or Jersey Jack, but I'm working with some of the other guys, and I'm very excited about the projects I'm working on. And I think once these things get revealed and that'll happen soon i mean it's it's just after the beginning of april in 2021 right now but by by summer mark my words if you're a collector and you're interested in real pinball machines it's going to be extremely exciting you're going to have so much choice there's going to be something for you and it's going to pry money out of your wallet <laughs> keep this thing going yeah, and if you have too many machines at your house, you may have to do what Steve Ritchie said. You might have to, you and your wife might have to get bunk beds so you can fit a few more go. in the bedroom. Absolutely. Just to get one more in there. <laughs> David and I did another show where we talked about another Stern pinball machine called Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm going to put a link to that right up there and find out how easy it might be to play that game, maybe. And I am making a slight joke there, nod to something I talked about earlier in the show. So head over there with us and we'll talk about Stern's Pirates of the Caribbean. In the meantime, David, thank you for being on the show with me and sharing your music. It was really cool to be able to listen to that and talk about it, and I hope others will be able to enjoy it too. Well, I'm thrilled, Mike. I mean, some of this has been sitting on the floor for a long time, and I'm really glad to be able to pick it up and share it because uh, I had a good time making it. I, I I always feel like if I'm having a good time, it'll, it'll be infectious. So that's one of my criteria. You know, it, I'm writing stuff, and at some point I listen, am I having fun? No, I'm not. Let's try something else. <laughs> That's a good gauge. <laughs> All right. Thank you for watching and listening, and we will see you next time.